In the final part of today's lecture, we're going to talk about the gradient perturbation approach, which is currently the prevailing approach for differentially private machine learning. Um, this is a noisy form of gradient descent. This approach was first suggested by Williams and McSherry, um, and it was later uh, developed a little bit by Song et al. But the main, uh, the main coverage today, which we're going to talk about, is that of uh, Basili Smith and Thakurta in 2014. Um, this was kind of the first uh, work which really, really delves into the um, accuracy guarantees and privacy guarantees of uh, this type of approach. But um, there's been more recent ones. This, this paper took it from a theory perspective. There's more recent works which really do it uh, more empirically and see, see how it performs on large scale neural networks. We'll talk about those in a later lecture. So, okay, before we talk about noisy gradient descent, we must first talk about regular gradient descent, which is given in um, algorithm one. So you might have heard of uh, gradient descent. The main idea is just to follow essentially the gradient or the derivative of a, of a, of a function. So just to give you a simple example, suppose we wanted to, like, let's draw again the simplest convex function, say this function. Now, and we're trying to find the minimum, which is right here. What we can do is we can start at an arbitrary point, uh, um, an arbitrary x, of, uh, like let's say this is sort of the theta axis, theta. What we can do is just start at an arbitrary value of theta. So let's say, I don't know, we start here. And what we do is we compute the derivative or the, the gradient of the function, which says, uh, you know, it, it tells you how the function increases and decreases. So here the derivative would tell you if you want to increase, go this way. So, but we want to decrease, so instead we go the opposite direction. So essentially what gradient descent does is it says, okay, find, take the derivative, find which direction to go, and take a step in that direction. So maybe we could go uh, take a step in this way, which would take us from this point to this point right here. Now, this isn't the uh, exact uh, optimum but it's a step in the sort of right direction um, in the sense that we're closer now to the optimum. So what we can do is, you know, do the same thing again, find the derivative. Uh, the derivative says the increase is in this direction. And if we want to decrease, we go in this direction. So we take a step in this direction and that'll take us, I don't know, to maybe here. And then uh, so on, this is now closer to the optimum and we can keep going, go here, go here and eventually, you know, we'll eventually get to something which is very close to the true minimum, which is right here. So that's the idea of uh, gradient descent. You just keep following the direction where the derivative tells you uh, will cause the function to decrease the most. Um, now the direction of de decrease rather. Now let's say that this, this was a simple univariate case. Um, where we just sort of took the derivative, but you could consider this a multivariate case and the same sort of thing happens if you use the gradient. And, uh, right, so this is essentially describing what uh, projected gradient descent is. So this is essentially the algorithm which we just uh, talked about, except uh, with one little twist on it, but let's, let's walk through it. So the idea is the following. We start with a uh, theta zero. So theta zero is an in just an initial starting position. We can pick it to be any element in the set C. Recall, we're trying to optimize over all theta and C. We just pick it arbitrarily. It doesn't really matter too much how we uh, come up with it. This has to be within the set. And then what we do is the following. For we, we do a number of steps of the following iterative procedure. What we do is the following. So ignore this sort of pi here for now. There's a projection. But um, what we do for now is we we take our current uh, value, whatever uh, theta parameter vector, whatever point we're at so far. What we do is we compute the gradient at that point. That was like what I said, take the derivative. And we multiply it by what's known as the, uh, the uh, learning rate. This essentially tells you uh, how big a step you should take in that direction. So, you know, at the earlier steps in our algorithm before, we took a very large step, and then you see we took a smaller step, and then a smaller step, and a smaller step. So typically, we have a learning rate schedule, where at the beginning, we're going to let eta of t be rather large. 
Um, and as we progress, we take smaller and smaller steps uh, until we finally get very close to it, to the right answer. So that's all we do. We essentially take the current point and take a step in the direction uh, of the gradient, or in the negative direction of the gradient, rather. Now, I told you not to worry about this, um, but let's talk about this a bit, like, uh, like I said, the projection mechanism. It projects onto C. And by that, it means that, uh, you know, maybe, remember, recall that I said we're trying to optimize over a uh, set of, uh, over C where, you know, the valid parameters lie. But when we take a gradient descent step, it might be that it takes us outside of this ball of, uh, of valid solutions. So for example, suppose, you know, we had some set of possible solutions. So this is a set of all theta, or sorry, th this set overall is um, C equals this. So imagine we start at some point, uh, you know, theta naught, and we do gradient descent, and it takes us over, let's say, here. So now we're, you can see that this new point is outside of the uh, set C, so it's not a valid parameter solution. So what we instead do is we take this point and we project it onto the uh, set C by finding the closest point. So if we want to find the closest point to the set C, we can see right here, um, this will be theta 1. And then maybe we take another step uh, from here, and that takes us also out of the ball. Uh, and then what we do is we once again project it to the ball and give this theta 2. Maybe the next one takes us inside, and that'll be fine. That's theta 3 uh, without projecting, because we're already inside the set. And then theta 4 is over here or something, and so on. So that's a rough idea as to, uh, you know, how we, uh, how, how, like how projected gradient descent works. It'll repeatedly take steps uh, in the direction of the negative gradient. And if it takes us outside of the set of valid solutions, then it'll project it back into it. And this, is, this algorithm is effective in fairly general settings, even settings which it shouldn't uh, work in, and we don't have any theoretical understanding of why it works. It still is effective, and uh, let's state one such guarantee of well, what type of uh, theoretical guarantees we can expect, um, which are a bit more general than what we'll need, but uh, we'll revisit them later. So let's see, this is a theorem uh, due to uh, Shamir and Zhang, I believe, um, but Okay, so suppose we have some convex function f, and let theta hat be the true optim or theta star be the true optimizer over the set. So this is essentially just the same setting we've been looking at, where we're trying to optimize our, our loss function overall for the data set will be our function f. But the idea is let theta let this essentially des this line describes the uh, algorithm. We're just going to let theta not be an arbitrary point in the set and repeatedly do uh, steps where you can see here. We don't have the gradient of the function. We have g of t. So this is written, well, why do we have g of t, which we're subbing in for the uh, gradient? Well, what we're going to do is we're not necessarily going to say that g of t has to be equal to the gradient. We're going to say that it's a random variable whose expectation is equal to the gradient and has variance or second moment bounded by uh, some quantity here. So if we have something which works at, as an estimate of uh, the uh, variance in that way, or estimate of the gradient, uh, sort of unbiased estimator of the gradient, and we can bound the variance, then, um, or rather the magnitude of it, if we use an appropriate learning rate function here, so you plug that in for the uh, eta of t, um, note that it decays, like it starts by taking bigger steps as we have t small, but um, takes uh, smaller steps as it increases, as we converge to the correct solution. So yeah, it tells us how to set the learning rate. And then if you do that, then for any t greater than zero, however many steps you take, we have the following type of guarantee. And you can see that this is uh, one of these uh, expected excess empirical risk bounds, uh, where it says that the function on the point we get at the end, sorry, this should be uh, theta capital T, minus uh, the function at the optimal value will be bounded above by uh, essentially this quantity here. So yeah, this gives us, we haven't looked at it, we haven't actually talked about quantitatively, quantitatively how large these bounds are, but for the first time we have one here. Essentially, I mean, you can see it depends linearly on the di diameter of the 
um, set uh, and also on uh, the second moment bound on the uh, estimator of the gradient. But uh, more importantly than that, it decays as one over square root of the number of steps t. So this is cool because uh, it, it, yeah, it gives you the convergence guarantee of this uh, projected gradient descent on any sort of convex function uh, that you might have. So let's try to apply this for our setting. Um, all you need to do is, it's very equal, easy actually, all you need to do is note that the fact that uh, like the gradient of L on theta uh, t minus one comma d, this is equal to g sub t on, or I guess I have some indexing mis mismatch, but really this, this is the, this is our estimator gt at theta t is going to be equal to the loss function. So notice in particular that, you know, the expectation is equal to that because it's exactly that quantity. And the other thing we need is the fact, uh, is the bound on the sort of squared uh, value of it. And it's not too hard to see that this is bounded above by, or in fact, it's, I guess, yeah, it's bounded above by, uh, g squared. In particular, what we do is we let g be equal to n times the Lipschitz constant L. So yeah, maybe we haven't discussed this in a while, but recall that we assumed that, uh, that the loss function, like the L, little lowercase l, has the Lipschitz constant uh, capital L. So therefore, the overall uh, gradient, sorry, re recall that it has a Lipschitz function, or sorry, it has Lipschitz constant L, and therefore, that implies that the gradient for each individual point is going to be bounded by capital L. And since we sum up n such points, then we have an overall uh, n times L for the value of g. So that implies that we can run algorithm one and apply theorem two, where we substitute in this value of uh, g. And that'll give us the excess risk bound of the following, which is something like uh, O tilde, this hides log factors, of um, size of C, equal two norm, times N L over square root T. So yeah, that's uh, nice. And in particular, if you say T to be greater than or equal to, say, some constant times uh, N squared L squared, uh, the L two norm of C, uh, squared divided by alpha squared, then this implies that um, the, the excess risk is going, this, this quantity here is going to be less than or equal to alpha. Right, so that's kind of convenient. Note that in particular, you can, if you take t large enough in this sort of noiseless setting where you're just doing a gradient descent, um, you're eventually going to get down to something which is arbitrarily close to the uh, optimum. You just have to be willing to spend enough time on it and do enough computation on it. Now, one of the downsides of this is the running time. So how much time does this take? Well, uh, we're going to run it for t iterations, right? t iterations. And how long does each iteration take? Each iteration takes uh, n time just because we compute a gradient, or not t n time, it's going to take n gradient computations because uh, you need to compute the gradient for each point in the set. So, and note that because we have t is approximately equal to n squared, that means we have, uh, we have approximately equal to an n cubed time algorithm, which is not, not exactly that great. It's not, it's not the best. Uh, we'd really like something faster. In, for, in particular, this is not going to be very effective practically, and. Uh, in, as a result, people use what's known as stochastic gradient descent, uh, SGD as it's commonly known, which is perhaps the most popular algorithm in the world right now. Um, sorry, that's maybe not true, but definitely in machine learning, it's the most popular algorithm in the world right now. Um, yeah, the main difference is rather than computing this entire gradient, uh, L, like the gradient of the entire function L, uh, what instead we're going to do is pick a random point and compute the gradient only on that point. So you can see the pseudocode, uh, or, or yeah, the pseudocode written out here, algorithm two. So let's, let's highlight the differences. The differences are as follows. So there's this step here, 
where we now select a, a point uniformly at random. And yeah, we pick one point from the entire data set. And the difference is instead of uh, computing, what is it, grad of L on the entire data set, um, data t minus one comma d, uh, that is transformed into this different one where we, instead we choose this random point and we compute the gradient at that one point. But then just to make it unbiased as an estimator for the overall uh, gradient, we scale it up by a factor of n. So yeah, this is, it's very similar to before. We just use a slightly different uh, estimator, uh, which is essentially going to replace our uh, g sub t that we used before. Um, so yeah, it's not hard to do it from here. So we can reapply the same theorem as above. Um, this time, like I said, we're going to let uh, g sub t of theta t be equal to n times gradient of L theta sub t minus one x, or I guess we're, we re indexed it again, theta xi, yi. And uh, yeah, where this i is chosen uniformly at random, it's not hard to see that if you just do the calculations, that expectation of g sub t theta t is going to be equal to uh, gradient of like the overall loss function. And furthermore, we have that the expectation of the uh, second moment this time This is going to be equal to n squared, or less than or equal to n squared times l squared, uh, giving that g is equal to nl, just as before. And this can be done by a simple calculation. Um, yeah, just try it yourself and you'll see. So in particular, these are the exact same quantities we had before. We had, uh, the, it's unbiased, and also we have that, um, yeah, we have the fact that uh, g is equal to nl again. And uh, yeah, from there, we can just exactly get the exact same uh, error bound that we had before um, with the same excess empirical risk because all the parameters are the same. The only difference is, let's take a look at the number of computations you have to do this time. This time, you just pick a random point. Uh, you do t iterations again, but now you only pick a random point in each one. So now you only take uh, t times n gradient computations, which is approximately equal to n squared computations. Yeah, so this is uh, a factor n in terms of running time uh, better than uh, before. So yeah, this is stochastic gradient descent. That's great without privacy, but now let's talk about what happens if we try to introduce privacy here. And this is really such a simple algorithm. There's only one good place to inject noise into the process. So it's not going to be too hard to privatize. Um, and you can see the result right here. So all we're going to do is this is a, let's let's highlight the differences with the previous algorithm. Oh, let's use orange, I guess. So what are the lines which differ from the non-private version of uh, SGD? Well, this line here, where we define what the noise is, and right about here. Nowhere else. Es essentially, I feel like the first one is even cheating. Really, the one difference between the two things is here, where we add noise to the gradient. Okay, so let's, let's uh, yeah, let, let me just emphasize that once again, how simple this is. All we have to do is do the exact same SGD algorithm as before, but all we do is we privatize the gradient after computing it, um, and that will, we're using, say, Gaussian noise, and then just running the algorithm as a whole will uh, give us the desired result. Uh, the analysis will fall very similar to before. In particular, I'm go we're going to go over both the utility as well as the privacy of this approach, um, but I can describe them to you. They're both very simple. I can do them in about like a, you know, a sentence each before we go into the details. But really, in order to argue about the utility, all we're going to do is use the exact same type of accuracy guarantee that we had before. Um, in particular, we still have an unbiased estimator for the uh, gradient of the function, but now we just have to take into account the second moment here. But once you do that, it'll, it, things work out and you can just say that, uh, basically read off what the accuracy guarantees are from the previous uh, theorem we used. 
Um, and as for the privacy, it's going to be a simple combination of just three things, which uh, maybe you already know. You know at least two of them, that's for sure. The first thing is the privacy guarantee of the Gaussian mechanism, because we're using Gaussian noise. The second thing is that we save a factor of n in our privacy guarantee by using a, a sort of sampling, subsampling amplification uh, lemma. And the third thing we're going to use is advanced composition. Putting those three things together, then that's all you have to do. Um, yeah, this is a nice, simple uh, approach, and it's very convenient. You can see th this is once again a testament to the power of differential privacy, because you know you just add noise into the right place. Uh, it composes very nicely when we do use advanced composition. Uh, everything you do with it after you privatize it is going to be private because of uh, post processing and so on. So yeah, this once again another testament to the power of uh, differential privacy is really its modularity. So let's uh, go into a bit more about uh, the, you know, the arguments here. Uh, how can we uh, argue about utility? Well, again, we have that gt of theta t is equal to, uh, now we, we change it by including this uh, b term, n times the gradient of l theta t x i y i plus b of t. And once again, we note that the expectation is going to be equal to the, uh, to the gradient. And the reason is because it's essentially the same thing as before, uh, when we know the expectation of that is equal to the expectation of the gradient, or is equal to the gradient, rather. The linearity of expectation says just take the expectation of this and add it on, but we know that this is a mean zero random variable so yeah, it's exactly uh, equal to the expectation of this uh, variable here is equal to the gradient of the function. So nothing to change there. However, the second moment is a little bit different. Let's uh, just describe uh, what needs to be done to change it here. We just have that the expectation of the uh, second moment. Well, expanding this out, essentially just uh, sort of squaring this quantity here, it can be written as the following. We have n squared times the expectation of the gradient of like the loss function at this value. I'll not write the whole thing function out. B squared plus 2n times expectation. This is kind of the cross term where we take the inner product of the gradient of L as well as uh, B of T. And uh, the expectation of the sort of other term. And this is going to be, we're going to bound each of these terms individually. So first of all, the first term can be bounded just using the same fact as before. So we're just asking what the bound on the gradient is. Well, the gradient is bounded by, you know, we know it's Lipschitz, so therefore this is bounded by L. So this term is at most n squared L squared. Now, this term is the inner product of uh, the gradient of uh, the single point with uh, the Gaussian noise. But the thing is, this Gaussian noise is mean zero. So therefore, uh, this is just going to be uh, have magnitude zero, just because the expectation is going to be zero for each individual term in the summand. And then finally, the last term, which is just sort of the squared of the L2 norm of the Gaussian noise. Well, this is just going to be uh, d times uh, sigma squared. The reason is because each of these sort of the bt is a vector where each of the terms is a uh, Gaussian with a mean zero and variance sigma. So just squaring that would make each term equal in expectation to sigma squared, thus giving us this term overall. Good, so just substituting this into the bound uh, that we had before, then we get the following type of excess risk bound. We have that uh, expectation of theta f on theta t. I guess, let me, sorry, this shouldn't be uh, this, let, like, let me write down, actually, it's going to be L on theta T, capital T, rather, on um, the database minus the loss function for the optimal on the database is less than or equal to, what is it going to be? We can just, like, really substitute in, I'm going to say O tilde again, again, to avoid uh, log factors, ignore them, rather. Uh, the L2 norm of C times, uh, we have this term 
g here n squared l squared plus uh, d sigma squared divided by oh yeah and I, while it's a uh, while uh, before we did it from one to t this time we're just going to do it from uh, one to n squared I'm, I'm going to fix t to be equal to n squared just to start with um, and yeah so we just sub in that term here. Now, expanding out the expression for sigma squared, if you just do that uh, and you know simplify this a bit, we will get a term which is roughly O tilde of C L2 norm times uh, L square root of D log one over delta over say epsilon. Yeah, so this is roughly the type of, um, th this is the accuracy guarantee we get roughly. And you can just sort of check this, and this is, this is not bad. We don't really have anything to compare it with, I guess. Um, you can compare it with the non-private version if you'd like, and see where the new costs come in. Um, I guess one of the big ones is now we incur a dependence on the dimension in terms of our risk bound, which wasn't there before. But it turns out that that type of dimension dependence is also necessary. But yeah, that's the uh, accuracy, the utility guarantee we get. It remains, as the last part of this lecture, just to talk about how private this is. Um, and yeah, the privacy guarantee we'll cover here. Uh, yeah, so like I said, there's kind of three ingredients in the recipe. And the sort of uh, ingredient one will be Gaussian mechanism. Step two is going to be amplification by subsampling. And step three is going to be advanced composition. And we'll see how we apply these uh, one by one. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, look at, you know, applying the Gaussian mechanism. And how do we do that? Well, recall that, what, what are we noising? We're going to be noising the estimate of the gradient. So recall that we're going to be adding noise to n times the gradient of L, theta t minus one, uh, xi, yi. And what can we say about the L2 sensitivity of this? Well, we know that the magnitude of this is uh, bounded. In particular, the magnitude of this, if we just uh, take sort of, uh, yeah, we know since we know the uh, the function is Lipschitz, we know that like uh, the L two norm of uh, this is going to be less than or equal to L, and therefore this L two sensitivity of this, I guess, um, if you're doing the swap one, is going to be uh, L two sensitivity is less than or equal to I guess two times uh, n L, just because uh, it could be pointing in the opposite direction, which will give us a factor of two here. Okay, so that's, uh, that's sort of the L2 sensitivity, and we know how to apply the Gaussian mechanism. So one thing we're going to do for now is assume uh, I is fixed. So we didn't really pick it randomly. Um, we need to do pick it randomly for the accuracy, but like just for the sake of argument, let's suppose we, instead of picking it uh, arbitrarily or randomly, we just picked it uh, in some sort of fixed way. We know what R is and the or I is, and the algorithm sort of publicly releases this even, what value of I was picked. The reason why we do this is just for the privacy analysis, and then we're going to argue using step two that if we instead picked it randomly instead of in a fixed way, then it'll be uh, more private. So, okay, assume I is fixed for now. Then the Gaussian mechanism, I'll just call it GM, implies that... Uh, the privacy loss random variable for uh, this quantity here, which I'll just call g sub t of theta sub t, is going to be bounded above in terms of like, uh, it's going to be bounded above by epsilon over two square root log one over delta with probability one minus delta over two. And this is just using the Gaussian mechanism, really. There's, there's nothing special I've done here. All I did was really um, take uh, 
uh, something like that. How do I do this? Yeah, I'll just say that basically all I did was uh, take this value of uh, sigma we have here, this one uh, right here. Oh gosh, I got this stuck here. Move this. Yeah, I'll put it here. Okay, yeah, all I did was really take this value of uh, of uh, sigma squared you see here. And, you know, substitute in the Gaussian mechanism and do the calculations as usual. You can see that, you know, we have this n times l, which need to appear in the numerator, the log 1 over delta, and the epsilon, which appears in the denominator, and so on. So really, all we did was uh, just apply that, uh, apply the Gaussian mechanism and just get what guarantee that gives. And it'll tell us that the privacy loss random variable for this uh, quantity here, um, after you noise it uh, with this uh, Gaussian noise, will uh, be bounded by this quantity here with probability 1 minus delta over 2. So that's step one, the Gaussian mechanism check. Now, the thing is, like I said, we assumed that I is fixed, but we can actually get some uh, amplification via subsampling. This is sort of a common tool and common trick in settings where we subsample from a data set. Um, but uh, let, me, let me just write a sort of lemma, which I guess I could have had, but uh, a sort of folklore lemma, I guess. Um, Suppose if, if an algorithm A is epsilon prime less than one differentially private, so if we have a differentially private algorithm where epsilon prime is less than one, then uh, if executed on a larger, on, let, let's say on a subsample, Uh, on a on a subsample from from a data set, let's say on a subsample from a data set of size n, and let's say the subsample that we're looking at is of size say, gamma times n. Uh, then the result is. Uh, 2 times gamma times epsilon prime, differentially private. So, okay, let, let me just sort of uh, tell you what, this, what I mean by this. Essentially, if we assume that i is fixed, then we'll have some algorithm which is, however, much differentially private. However, I claim the following. If we take into account the fact that we picked i randomly, and then we run it on this random uh, data set, then we're going to get a much smaller privacy parameter. Um, in particular, let's, let's take a look at the setting that we're looking at right now, where we pick a random i from n. Then we have that uh, we execute on a size uh, 1 subsample. So we have really that gamma is equal to 1 over n for our uh, instance. So therefore, that'll give us that uh, instead of getting epsilon prime, so we have epsilon prime is equal to uh, you know, epsilon over 2 square root log 1 over delta. What we do now is because uh, since we're picking with probability uh, 1 over n, a random point, each, each random point, then the epsilon we get will be, this will be transformed by increasing it or multiplying by a factor of 2 gamma, which will give us epsilon over n uh, log 1 over delta dp with probability 1 minus delta over 2. Since once again, you know, we have, uh, it's not exactly pure dp, but uh, we have this sort of failure event, which will give it the approx dp of uh, this quantity. It's going to be epsilon over n comma delta over 2 dp, essentially. So that's step two. Now we've argued that uh, each iteration of this algorithm is going to be oh sorry let, let me let me make one thing clear actually uh, that I didn't make clear before 
So uh, since we add fresh noise each time, uh, what we're going to have is actually that, you know, this is true for all t equals 1, 2, n squared simultaneously. So for every iteration, in fact, we have this privacy loss random variable. And similarly here, um, for all t equals 1 to n squared, we have this uh, same uh, guarantee for each one individually. Now, the last part is we have this sort of privacy loss random variable guarantee for each of these uh, individual iterations. But now, how do we com uh, combine these? Well, uh, you know, since we have epsilon over n, uh, roughly epsilon over n dp for each uh, iteration, then uh, multiplying it by the square root of number of uh, queries we do uh, will give us the right result. So let, let, let me say that again. Essentially, there's like n squared iterations. Remember that when we use advanced composition, so we would, one thing we could do is use like basic composition, and then we would get, uh, if we use basic composition, we would get that the overall thing would be, uh, if we use basic composition, we would get that the overall thing would be epsilon n, roughly something like epsilon n delta over 2 dp. But instead, using advanced composition, because uh, why, why is this? Um, essentially, you multiply the privacy of each round by the number of rounds you have, which is going to be epsilon times n in the end. But if you use advanced composition, recall that you only pay uh, the square root of the number of iterations that you have. So in other words, that'll multiply by a factor of root n, uh, sorry, by a factor of root of n squared, which is a factor of n. And therefore, you're, you're overall going to get epsilon comma delta dp. Yeah, recall that uh, you sort of multiply by this log, square root log 1 over delta, and you increase the value of the delta. But if you kind of do the math out carefully, you'll see that the main sort of important part is the fact that you're doing epsilon over n, and you pay square root of n squared uh, for n, square root of n squared iterations, getting rid of that n, and overall giving you epsilon delta dp. So that's good. Today we really saw two, or we saw a number of different methods of uh, doing differentially private empirical risk minimization. And uh, we concluded by seeing in sort of detail how to do uh, a differentially private gradient descent. In following lectures, we're going to see a bit more about how to take this, this is sort of a theory result which I presented to you, but let's see if we can make it even better, more practical, and in particular, go on to uh, you know, do this in, say, neural network settings and how it performs in those cases.